Why intercede alfalfa into Bermuda grass? Well, there's several good reasons for doing this. And I think it's important for us to think about an ability for us to actually grow our own nitrogen. Uh, as expensive as nitrogen is right now, uh, putting alfalfa into Bermuda grass uh, virtually eliminates the need for ex additional nitrogen. So we're able to grow the nitrogen that we need for that crop, but also we're increasing the overall quality of the forage as well. In our experience, when we introduce the alfalfa into the Bermuda grass, we're increasing that RFQ by as much as 30 or more points. Uh, that's a pretty substantial increase in quality, and it can definitely uh, reduce the amount of supplementation that's needed uh, to feeding your livestock. It makes excellent supplemental feed in that sense, but it also makes a good cash hay crop as well. Now, when we put that alfalfa into the Bermuda grass, it actually enables us to get the alfalfa dried down a little faster, which is always a challenge in our environment. It also allows us, it also allows us to get a uh, much cleaner crop put up as well. If all else fails though, and your Bermuda grass uh, is going to still be underneath there, if all else fails and that alfalfa begins to uh, thin out or, or fail to make a stand at all, you still have Bermuda grass there. So you haven't really destroyed the crop uh, that's serving as the base uh, for your, your forage system. When we think about alfalfa management, I also think about two continuums. A continuum of soil quality. There are certain soils that are going to be better than others. And then there are managers, let's face it, that there are some managers that are better than others. And really when we start thinking about uh, Bermuda grass, for example, Bermuda grass, you know, poor soil conditions can be made up a little bit by uh, management skill. And, and vice versa, poor management skill can be made up a little bit by soil conditions. But when we start looking at perennial peanut and especially alfalfa, we need a little bit more management there to be able to make it uh, as productive and, and as economically viable as possible. Now, the soil conditions that are needed for alfalfa are, are number one, it needs to be very well drained, deep soils. Uh, it has a very deep tap root and needs to be able to explore that root zone. One of the key factors there, of course, is the soil pH. The soil pH is maintained at about 6.5 or greater uh, in these areas where the alfalfa can be planted in. I definitely would not recommend going in and planting alfalfa unless you had a soil pH of about 6.2 or greater to begin with. You also need to maintain uh, adequate levels of phosphorus and potash. Uh, alfalfa is a substantial user of phosphorus and potash, and so it's important to have those nutrients available. It's also important for us to add minor nutrients like boron and molybdenum as it's necessary for that crop. Uh, alfalfa is actually one of the few forage crops that we have a recommendation for boron and molybdenum for. Now there are many, many advantages to alfalfa. One is, is that it's a very valuable crop as I've already talked about, some of the best quality forage that we can grow. But we also need to think about where is this going to fit. It's adapted to our well-drained soils as I mentioned, where we've got good fertile soils as well as good management in place. And when you have that kind of scenario, there's a very good possibility that you can keep uh, alfalfa in stand for in excess of five to six, seven years, especially in the Limestone Valley and Piedmont region of North Georgia. Now, even down in the Coastal Plain region, we're seeing many of these fields that will last five, six, seven years or more. Now there are some where the fertility isn't uh, right, and those may play out after two to three years. But in general, we're seeing uh, some really great uh, opportunities there to, to produce alfalfa. Especially if you have an irrigated field, you can really turn off a lot of alfalfa tonnage. But even in a dryland situation, uh, uh, partnering that with Bermuda grass, and you end up with a crop that is very, very uh, water use efficient. The soil pH again needs to be in excess of 6.5, but when you look at that subsoil pH, you really need to be looking at uh, an excess of 5.5 as well. And that subsoil pH is important to have in that range 
just to make sure that that root system as it goes down through does not become um, damaged as a result of that low soil pH. Now it does have a high blow potential, so if we're grazing it by itself, uh, we have a challenge. But oftentimes if it's with the Bermuda grass, the bloat issue is going to be relatively negligible. Typically we're going to see this used as hay, but also as a silage crop. But it can be grazed uh, very effectively as well. We've got a number of producers who are grazing alfalfa. From an establishment perspective, we need to be putting out about 20 to 25 pounds of seed per acre if we're drilling it, or 22 to 25 pounds if we're broadcasting it. And these are the couple of varieties that we would recommend, although I've got a list here later on with an expanded list of varieties for uh, the different areas of, of Georgia. So how do you make sure that you get a successful stand uh, when you're trying to establish alfalfa into Bermuda grass? Well, the number one thing is to start with a very well-drained site. Uh, that well-drained site, as I mentioned several times now, is critically important. And then you soil test and lime uh, uh, and fertilize according to those recommendations from that soil test. Again, the ideal levels are a pH of 6.5 or above and high levels of P and K, which many of our pastures and hayfields do have that because of a history of poultry litter or other kinds of uh, nutrients being added over the years. It's also important to pay attention to the requirements for boron and molybdenum, especially during the establishment phase. That's a very critical part of its life cycle. One of the more common mistakes that folks make is that they try to plant at the wrong time of the year. Uh, this is a crop that definitely needs to be planted in the fall. And if you're in the mountains or the Piedmont area, that needs to be from September 15th through the middle part of October. And then the coastal plain region, middle part of October through the middle part of November. When you plant it into Bermuda grass, it's critically important to have that Bermuda grass relatively short. It needs to be only one to two inches when you plant into it. And actually what we would recommend doing is going in and spraying the existing Bermuda grass with a uh, non-selective herbicide of some sort to try to suppress that uh, Bermuda grass as well. Um, Paraquat and Gramoxone or glyphosate in the form of Roundup or something like that uh, will work quite well at, at uh, suppressing that Bermuda grass. And you can actually burn off that, that excess um, thatch and material prior to planting uh, without it having a major impact on uh, the stand. Then you would come in with a no-till drill and plant that in, preferably with a no-till drill if you're planting it into Bermuda grass. Uh, the seeding rate in this case would be 22 to 25 pounds just to ensure that you get a good solid stand. We'd recommend planting in seven to nine inch rows. Most of our no-till drills have a, uh, a setting that's in that range of row spacing. Then we want to make sure that we plant no deeper than about a half of an inch. If we get the seed planted any deeper than that, it has great difficulty in coming up and taking off. Then number six would be, is after the emergence, um, not too long after we plant, we need to be out there spraying with an insecticide to control mole crickets and other insect pests. This is a very critical part of the, the development of that alfalfa. When we're planting into Bermuda grass, that Bermuda grass thatch and the material there is very much a reservoir for uh, insect pests and particularly the mole crickets. And as that alfalfa begins to germinate, if it gets nipped off, uh, then that's, that plant is actually dead and not going to be able to uh, contribute to the stand. What we would recommend is using something like Mustang Max or Karate or uh, some of the other uh, types of insecticides like that at their highest level rates for, for the application. If possible then, if you can irrigate, that's good. If not, then uh, you're beholden to the rainfall. However, again, this is a very uh, drought tolerant crop. Generally speaking, it will do well even in a dry land situation. Here you can see a slide uh, picture of uh, some Bulldog 505 that was planted into uh, some Alicia Bermuda grass in the fall of uh, 2009. Um, this is uh, some, uh, a dairy field here just outside of uh, Watkinsville. Here you can see one of our producers down in Coffee County. This is uh, Mark Vickers. 
uh, on the right hand side. He's been producing Bermuda, Bermuda grass and alfalfa mix as well as pure alfalfa uh, square bales for the horse hay market. Here you can see a producer in Eccles County uh, down south of Valdosta, southeast of Valdosta, uh, producing some uh, Tifton 85 and alfalfa and Bermuda grass mix. This picture was taken in early August. It's critically important, again, getting back to the soil pH issues, to make sure that we have uh, that soil pH remedy down deeper in the soil profile, and mainly because of the impact that it has on the root system. On the left hand side there, you can see the impact that it's having on uh, that low soil pH on the root system, and then where it's treated and, and allowed to more fully develop, and you can see the root system that develops as a consequence. It's also important to select the right variety. And this has been one of the biggest revolutions that has, has occurred here is that the alfalfa varieties that we have now to choose from are far superior to the ones that we once had. And it's important that you look for a dormancy rating of between 5 and 8. Uh, that is an indication of its growth patterns after September 1. Now the lower numbers are very, very critical for winter survival in the northern part of the U.S. But the lower numbers are more appropriate for us here in the southeast part of the U.S. When we're evaluating varieties, we also need to evaluate their disease resistance potentials. And if we think about all of the disease problems that are potentially out there, uh, we need to make sure that there is at least a moderate level of resistance, or preferably highly resistant, to all of those disease problems uh, that, that may be listed. Now here's a listing of some of the many varieties that are out there, and these would be those that we would actually recommend. Um, and you can see those that are marked for CP for Coastal Plain would be recommended for the Coastal Plain only. Those for the P and M would be for Piedmont and Mountain areas. And then the S would denote those varieties that could be planted throughout the entire state. Those that are bolded actually indicate those varieties that tended to uh, produce not only the highest yield, but also had the best stand density at the end of the study after three years. So we would highly recommend looking at and focusing on those uh, as, as varieties that will be a little bit more vigorous and uh, more durable in our environment. Here you can see the variety trials actually for uh, one of the results for Tifton. And you can see varieties like Bulldog 805 and Bulldog 505 fared quite well, uh, not only in terms of yield, but also in terms of uh, stand and persistence. So what are some of the keys to maintaining alfalfa in the Bermuda grass once we have it there? Well, the first three all go hand in hand, and it's really, really critical that we maintain good potash fertility. Uh, I, I have this as a joke, but really there's uh, having that much emphasis on potash is extremely important. Uh, it's really, really critical to have uh, that potash requirement met for the alfalfa. And by the way, the potash requirement of alfalfa is actually identical to the potash requirement that we have for Bermuda grass. Uh, so it's really important that we focus on uh, providing not only the potash for the alfalfa, but also for the Bermuda grass as well. It's also important that we maintain enough boron and molybdenum, some of those micronutrients, very critical for nodule formation and nitrogen uh, uh, fixation. I would also recommend that you routinely take a tissue sample one week prior to the uh, second cutting of the year so that you can get a determination of any other kinds of fertility needs that may be present. Uh, these would deter uh, help us see if there are any uh, nutrients that are not sufficient for the, for the crop itself. Then I would also recommend that every February and early March you'd be out there scouting and spraying for alfalfa weevils as they, they come in, and also for any fall armyworms that may be a problem during the summer months. Uh, insect problems are going to be a challenge, they always are, but we have excellent tools now that provide a very cost-effective uh, control of many of these problems. If you'd like more information about growing alfalfa, I would highly recommend 
our publication called Alfalfa Management in Georgia, and also a publication that I co-authored with several colleagues from around the Southeast, Growing Alfalfa in the South. All of these can be found on our website at georgiaforages.com, and I encourage you to check that website out for more information.